How are you all doing on this wonderful Sunday? That's good. And if you're not enjoying your Sunday quite yet, well, we can definitely turn that around. Upside down because it's Jujitsu Kaisen Sunday with a brand new chapter. Chapter 146 review from me, your host, Griever, as always. Yada, yada, yada. Plug, plug, plug. Let's get into the chapter because this chapter, thank God for this chapter. Am I right? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go out on a limb. This chapter review is probably going to be a little bit shorter than the previous ones, and I'll tell you why. Because I sort of am just going to take the liberty that I'll understand more as this arc goes on. That is my stance. I don't know why I have to enunciate every single word. Okay, that's getting old. Um, but what I'm talking about, what am I talking about? Well, in this chapter, you know, we got the rules of the culling game. I think it was chapter 143. We got at the end of the chapter, we got all those rules. And it was like, okay, I'm a little lost. <laughs> okay, I'm a lot lost, right? And I was talking to like Miss Content and a bunch of people in his Discord, more Jujutsu Kaisen fans. They were trying to explain it to me. Some people in my Discord, some people on my YouTube channel. Uh, they were trying to explain it to me and I sort of grasped it, not quite. This chapter actually goes on and explains it for the people like me who didn't really fully grasp what exactly the hell was going on. And we get actually some more details about how this is going to work with the colonies. There's 10 colonies spaced out amongst Japan. Uh, Hokkaido is not included because that's like the Jiu-Jitsu organization. It's sacred land. There's a huge barrier. Tengen explains all that. Yuki and Tengen go and say, okay, so Hokkaido is not included, but the rest of Japan is broken up within 10 colonies from the south to the north. And then there's like these two, I like to think it almost like uh, that thing like from season three of Digimon or whatever, where you have like these two like airships or these two like UFOs basically with a giant curtain, almost like a fishnet. Have you ever seen like how boats do like giant, like actual industrial size fishing? It's like from one boat to the other, they have this giant net. And, but in this case, it's like a giant barrier or a giant like scanner. And it's just just going to go straight across from one end to the other using the 10 canalities as the connection point so it can grab, well, 90% of Japan, you know, not including Hokkaido, uh, for the ritual, you know, to uh, get them prepped for the Tengen merge and all that stuff, right? But what I'm talking about previously was that I feel like Yuji about uh, Itadori halfway through this chapter. Because halfway through this chapter, because what they're going to do is they're sort of trying to re-explain the rules. We got introduced to a bunch of rules, the culling game, all this stuff that we had no previous knowledge of, and it is a little confusing. So I think what Geijay did, he decided to, like, maybe I should try to do a little more explanation, like details, before we get right into it and everybody gets a little lost. Uh, he just sort of tried to break this down in layman's terms, with Fushiguro leading the real questions for the most part. But... I basically am Yuji halfway through this chapter. Because halfway through this chapter, after they explain, like, I, I think they're on, like, halfway through the rules, and he and he's just like, I think I get it? Yeah, I definitely get some of it? 75%? I get it? Question mark? Yeah, I'm Yuji. I think I got it. I think I can. I think I can. And that's basically how I'm feeling right now. I think I've got a much better grasp of how the culling game is going to work and how the rules actually affect them uh, a little more so than I did previously for sure. But I think that also as we go through the arc, I'm going to understand a lot better. Um, so we're not going to really focus on any of that stuff, anything I don't understand in this chapter, because I think I got a much better grasp this time. And what I think is going to happen is as we go through the game, right? So... As we go through this arc, we're going to understand this stuff. So they talk about Angel for a little bit and the whole curse removal stuff, but they don't really focus on that. They're more, as I said, going through the first half of the chapters, going through trying to figure out, like, what is this? Like, what are the rules? How is this all going to work? Why is Hokkaido not included? Yada, yada, yada. Um, Fushiguro, as I said, asking the real questions, going, okay, like, so how long do we have left? He breaks it down to about 10 days. They have about 10 days left because it started. Uh, because remember, there's 19 days before everybody needs to clear themselves before, like, I guess the culling game, like, starts sort of idea. You need to be at a colony, one of these 10 places, uh, declare your participation, and then after 19 days. So it started, you know, Halloween night, and now it's already November 9th, so Fushiguro works it out that they have, like, 10 days. So this is where uh, they start to talk about, and this is where I got a little confused, but we see the return of Shoko that we haven't seen uh, Shoko Sensei, we haven't seen the doctor uh, for quite a long time. At least I don't remember seeing her for a long time now. 
And she is the one that's sort of in a flashback thing, breaks it down somewhat about how the curse technique removal works. Um, and it's probably not going to be idle transfiguration or whatever. She's sort of like, she explains it more in layman's terms about how this works. Like you have a curse technique, et cetera, et cetera. If the curse technique is removed, you die. So that's the rules of the game. And I was just like, okay, that's starting to make a little more sense. Um, and this is where Maki also brings up like herself and possibly Panda don't really have like that rule is negligible that, that doesn't matter they are actually more safe in contrast as she puts it in contrast sorcerers who don't have a cursed technique like maki they aren't affected by that rule because you know they don't have one so you can't take it away so the whole if your cursed technique is removed you die thing is irrelevant to her so this is where i think we're going to get a lot more focus on maki i think we're going to have because that's what people are complaining about uh somewhat is that maki's a really cool character she's a fan favorite character and she doesn't have a whole lot of focus uh she's had focus but not enough of it i think here we're in this culling game having no curse technique is going to be so vital like so vital in this fight and how it's going to like ebb and flow and her uh movements not exactly being restricted to these rules uh, this is going to be really, really cool. I think we're going to get a lot more of a sort of a mini Maki arc within the overall arc. And that's, that's a good thing for a lot of fans of Maki. I like Maki. I know you guys like Maki. So that's going to be pretty cool. And her haircut is semi grown on me. The, the funny thing is, is now she's looking more like Toji and everybody's saying like, oh, she's going to learn to be as strong as Toji. She's going to get the Toji stuff. Like she's going to be that badass. And I'm like, okay, okay, let's settle down a little bit. Let's settle down. We're sort of in like... Uh, we're still, we're just past East Blue Luffy and we're talking Yonko level here. Like, calm down, calm down, everybody, you know? So, uh, but still, I, I think it, uh, I think it's ironic that her hair is more Toji-esque, but, uh, I think that was intentional and Maki's still looking pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, as I said, they keep going over the other rules and stuff like that. Like, uh, they go through rule number three, four, five, six. They go through, like, half a dozen other rules. They talk about where to start with the colony and stuff because this is something that I was interested in, and I'm glad this was cleared up. Tengen explains that part of the binding vow of the culling game and stuff is to lock players in. The condition is that they themselves have entered of their own volition. They are aware of what's happening, and they enter themselves. Otherwise, it doesn't really count because... Yuji brings up an excellent point. What about people who are in the colony who don't even, like, know about that? Like, what about people who are there who don't want to be or choose to be, don't want to participate? And they're like, ah, see, this is why there's that option, blah, blah, blah. So Tengen's like, basically, the culling game has zero bias towards uh, Kenjaku. It has zero bias towards him. Now that it's sort of begun, it's going to have zero, it's not favorable or unfavorable for him or anybody else. It's going to be as fair as possible. They also explain this, explain this uh, with the Game Master stuff. They're all going to be followed by a small, like, sort of like a Navi sort of idea from Zelda. They're going to all be followed by a, a little, like, Beetle uh, shiki, uh, Shikigami. They're going to be followed by a little Beetle one, and that's basically their sort of, like, their... Uh, little help button towards the game master to be able to contact him and et cetera, et cetera, because they ask who the game master is. It, it's not really relevant and stuff. Um, they also talk about the possibility of deleting an existing rule. Now, Fushigoro brings up some cool stuff in this chapter where he talks about there's, uh, he's thinking like outside the box a lot of time, like, ah, like he, we'll talk about this in a second, but he basically goes, Oh, well, if we want more points to add our own rules, uh, I've got a worker, a couple of workarounds for how we don't have to actually kill anybody but still get points. And I was like, oh, I can't really think of one off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, okay, Fushiguro, he's smart. He's going to figure some stuff out. And he also figures out a way around the whole, all right, we can't delete a rule. And he goes, ah, but that doesn't mean that we can't make a rule that will potentially negate one of the other rules. The other rule will be in effect, but we can just make a rule that sort of in a loophole workaround way negate it and i'm like this is getting some like full metal alchemist death note sort of feel to it it's like ah yes it's like a b but haha how about c you know <laughs> like that sort of idea or one through ten i pick zero <laughs> it's like well shit i can't say that you you know okay um so i i, I do like how they are explaining this a little more because as i said it's making we're 
once again, I'm understanding how this Cullen game is going to go down a lot more, and they're really they're really trying to strategize here in this chapter. I can see that some people who probably understood everything about the Cullen game don't really know how you could, but uh, who understood all the rules, exactly how everything was going to go down from day one once we got the Cullen game rules, uh, this chapter might be a little boring them, for them. But for people like me who still, as I said, I'm still Yuji here, I'm still Itadori going... I think I get it, yeah, <laughs> you know, so for me, this was an excellent chapter so that I can enjoy the next, like, chapters and stuff and not be hung up on, okay, how is that possible, how is this possible, how is that possible, and have to keep referring to the culling game rules to make it all make sense. I'm glad we had this chapter, sort of breaking it down a little more thoroughly for, for people like me, um, and then, once again, Fushiguro goes, I already said, he goes on the line about, uh, you know, to gain points, you have to basically kill people, uh, or you'll be, if nothing happens, if the player score remains the same for the 19 days, then they will be subject to curse technique removal, which means they will be, you know, killed. So, uh, Fushigoro says he got some ideas regarding that, but he doesn't go into higher detail. Yuki and Chozo are going to stay there to guard Tengen, uh, and Maki says that she's going to return to the Zenin clan. We get the confirmation that Fushigoro is the new head of the uh, Zenin clan. We already knew that, but now it's, like, official, and... Uh, they talk about that the storeroom of Cursed Tools was all cleared out, but that was uh, Gojo, um, uh, I guess the Zenin clan uh, took out like a lot of their shit and stuff. So it's actually at the Zenin clan storeroom right now. And Maki's like, yeah, she's going to go there. She's going to get her out as many Cursed Tools as she can. She's going to figure that out. She also brings up that uh, weird dude from the, um, what's that arc called? The Goodwill event or whatever. The dude with the like like the weird tattoo, the black tattoo across his eyes that had the axes and stuff. Uh, I had to look that up because I was like, okay, do we know this character yet? So when I was reading this chapter, I was like, all right, I got to look this dude up. They want to find his workshop, his work, like workplace, because that was his thing. And I was like, ah, that's a good idea. So we're going to see some Maki upgrades here. She's going to have access to the, the curse tools that were in the uh, storeroom here that are now in the Zenin clan's possession. She's also going to probably try to make sort of combine maybe a curse tool from there and use the workshop and create her own or something. She's going to be so relevant in this arc. So that's going to make a lot of Maki fanboys happy. Like they're, they're just setting her up sort of not the main focus of this chapter, but they're making sure that she is relevant and everybody knows like she's going to do this. She's going to do that. She's going to do the other thing. It's like, yeah, okay. Maki it's, it's Maki's time to shine. I like that. And uh, so then afterwards, they talk about what Yuta's plans are. Because once again, I was really worried that Yuta was going to be one of the people that has to remain behind. Though I do like Yuki and Chozo, I was worried that Yuta was going to be one of them. Uh, because usually when you have the overpowered original MC, or if you will, or the season one MC come into the season two, he's already super powerful and it's sort of like, ah, we got to like take him away and stuff. And I find it really weird uh, that... Uh, you know, they, they wouldn't sort of try to pull that. But here it's like, no, no, they have a plan for Utah. They have a plan here. So he's not going to join the culling game uh, right away. Uh, so he said he wants to collect everything that he can. He's going to, uh, well, he did say that um, what he's going to do is he's going to prevent everybody from crushing each other and uh, something. So he's going to avoid all the nearby colonies and all that stuff. He's going to try to figure out as much information as possible before he enters. Now, they do run into a bit of a problem here because he's like, wait a minute. Sukuna has a plan for Fushigoro. So he's like, but I need to stay close to Itadori for that to happen. But Yuta works better alone and that like the it's more efficient in combat power wise if he's separate. So Yuta's going to go off and do his own thing. That's fine for now. Like, I don't mind that because it means he's still going to be relevant in this arc. We're still going to see him in this arc, but he's sort of going to move off and do his, do his own thing. Makes more sense, but they're sort of like, hmm, huh, uh, uh, about it. And Fushigoro's like, it's fine, it's fine. Listen, if, if, so, look, if he kills me, Yuta, just go and kill him afterwards, because you know what happened. And they're like, and you're just like, what the hell? And it's like, I love that once again, Yuta is not only like, sort of like, yeah, well, I'll give it a go. Like, he's not actually worried, like, if Sukuna eats all the fingers. He actually isn't like, well, right now I could probably take Sukuna, but if you actually get all the fingers, I don't know. Uh, that's probably not possible for me. Yuta's like, 
No, I mean, I got a shot at it. He's not as confident as Gojo. Like, don't worry, I can still kick his ass. I can still beat him. Yuta's not like, oh, I would win. But he's also not saying there's no chance. He's like, uh, I wonder what the chances are of that. 50-50, 60-40. I mean, I'll give it a shot. It's possible. So, like, and that's Yuta from Yuta. Remember how this dude was. So, I'm just like, okay, that's really cool. And the reason I'm bringing that up again is because the setup here, and Fushigoro also seems to be confident that Yuta is able to do that as well. So, I mean, a lot of confidence in Yuta here. And I understand as a Yuta fanboy. But here's where they're going to go find Kinji. They're going to go find Kinji. Hakurai Kinji. I'm probably butchering that name, but that's the third year student that was suspended. We finally, finally, I actually completely forgot about him during the Shibuya arc and stuff. I completely forgot about this guy. I was so happy to have Yuta back. I was so happy to see Toto enter the fight. Everything was like going crazy in the Shibuya stuff uh, that I didn't even remember that there is one more. There's one more mentioned student, so it's not like bullshit. Like, ah, the secret student that was there all along that's just as powerful as Gojo. No, no, no. This dude was mentioned before. Um, now, Maki talks about it and says, we don't have enough people right now. We need to find him and stuff. They ask about him being strong. Now, this is going to turn the community upside down. This, out of all the lines in this chapter, this is the one that's going to turn the community upside down, is the fact that Yuta says when he's on a roll or like when he's on point, when he's on his game, he is stronger than me. Now, that that's from Yuta himself. I'm not unhappy about this. I'm not unhappy about that. Like, it would be stupid to introduce a character that's clearly weaker than Yuta at this junction in the new arc. If, you, if he's going to be found, he's going to show up. He's got to be as strong or stronger than Yuta in some way. The way this is sounding, though, because Maki even says, like, liar. Like, Yuta's just, like, being nice sort of idea. Like, oh, trust me, when this dude is on point, when this dude is 100% focused, he's even stronger than me. And Maki's like, that's... No, no, he's not. But okay, whatever. He's still strong, but like, okay, you're being a little generous there. And that fits Yuta's character if that's possible. If Yuta's like, you know, whatever. That being said, I'm having an impression. This is giving me Seven Deadly Sins flashbacks when Meliodas said Escanor is stronger than me. There's probably a handicap to this because he specifically says when he's on point or when he's on a roll or when he's like focused or whatever. Uh, it depends on the translation, but because uh, I did read two translations for this chapter. But the point is, is it's very much sounding like an Escanor thing. Like, yeah, he can be as like stronger than me. It sounds like maybe it's a curse technique that's situational. Maybe it's not like the time of day cycle like uh, like Escanor, but something like that. Something that's limiting to him. Uh, that makes it so, yeah, Utah can kick his ass most times, but there is always like a 10% chance, maybe a 5% chance. There is a time when if he's able to go all out 100%, maybe it's luck-based, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, as I said, time of day, maybe it's situational. It's probably something to do with his curse technique that's very specific, but when the conditions are met, he is stronger than Utah. I'm fine with that because that's the way this is sounding. Uh, what do you guys think? I think this is very Escanor. This is very Meliota saying, Escanor is even stronger than me. Yeah, for like for like one hour of the day, he's potentially stronger than you. But for the rest of it, no, he's not, right? So, uh, but, so the statement's not incorrect, but it's lacking information. So I'm really getting that Seven Deadly Sins flashback. What do you guys think? Um, at this, we get a nice moment with uh, Yuji and Chozo at the end, basically saying, thanks for helping me. You know, he doesn't call him brother again or whatever, but he says, like, don't die. He's like, thanks a lot for all your help, Chozo. It really means a lot. So they're moving on. Uh, there's a funny scene where Chozo's just like, oh, I'm so proud. Um, you know, and it's just like, okay, you crying? You crying? And so anyway, that, that was really funny. The end part, we have a failed comedian. I'm getting very Joker vibes here. The failed comedian, classic. Uh, I'm getting very uh, the killing joke vibes here. 35 year old, not funny, blah, blah, blah. There is something I want to bring up though. Like, they're like, you should quit. You're not making anybody laugh. You're trying to be stand up. Uh, they bring up the fact that, yeah, there are late bloomers or people who suddenly take off, but they didn't all of a sudden like become funny. Sort of, sort of hitting, 
hit me a little bit here in the chest sort of idea. It's like, yeah, yeah, you might have, like, came into the game late, but people just blow up sometimes, you know. Uh, people, you know, they'll start. And in uh, what I've noticed here is that uh, not so much in the manga community, but in the gaming community. I've been playing Pokemon Nuzlocke, for example, for quite a long time on my old channel and this channel. And they always did okay, right? They, did, they didn't do bad. I saw a guy do a... Um, Start a new channel like four months ago. He started up. He's at like thirty thousand subs, and his videos have a hundred thousand, you know, plus uh, views. His videos are fine. They're good, but they're no better or worse quality or or fun or uh, that than I believe. Right. So once again, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, some some people just suddenly take off. There is no rhyme or reason. They even delve into that a little bit more with uh, the other guy. Uh, who's reading the newspaper after, like, you know, he's basically getting shit on by the manager or whatever, being like, listen, dude, they don't all of a sudden suddenly become funny. You don't all of a sudden become talented. You enter this industry at 40 and you're amazing, you know, great, but you don't all of a sudden go from being 39 and not a very good actor to 40 and now you're, like, you know, Judy Dench level or Meryl Streep level acting, right? It, it doesn't happen that way. You either could act before and... You just weren't discovered, or it's the other way. So they're really delving into some three-dimensional, some really re realistic stuff that happens in multiple industries. It happens here on YouTube. YouTube does not work on a fairness system, right? It just works on who's discovered what when, but it also works on what people enjoy, what people like. There's a lot of factors in there. And this guy brings it up too, saying that uh, some people are popular even if they aren't funny. And Buddy misunderstands says one hit wonders. He's like, no, no, no. It's like, you know, there are people who are always been funny and those who can always misunderstand that they are funny. And I was just like, uh, this is making like so much sense. Like there are tons of people on here. There are tons of YouTubers. There are tons of Twitch streamers. And you're sitting back going, how does this guy have a hundred million? Like, how does this guy have a million subscribers? H how are these videos popular? How the hell, like, I work so hard on this, or I've seen these other small-time YouTubers work on that. Like, how does my favorite YouTuber only have 10,000 subscribers when this guy who, like, his videos are crap and, and bad quality and terrible sound and he's not even funny and he's got, like, 150,000 subscribers. How is that fairness? That's not how it works. That's not how this industry works. It's never worked that way. And this is really just hitting home and I'm sure it works the same way in the manga industry so I'm sure that uh, you know the manga uh, Geji, Geji, Geji um, he's able uh, to pull from his own experiences within that I'm sure this happens not just on YouTube and in Hollywood but in the music industry the manga industry every industry right so really hitting home here at the end of the chapter but then we get the big reveal then we get the big reveal that this guy Takaba Fumihiko is who I don't know if we're supposed to know that name. I think this is a new guy. Uh, he's just a stand-up comedian, 35 years old, seemingly a failed comedian. Uh, and he's just like, you know, you got a 50-50 shot, whatever. And he's staring and he's looking and he's thinking. He goes, you say it's 50-50, but actually it's about 7 to 3. The ratio, the ratio, the ratio... What is going on here? Does, when Nanami died, does it mean that his curse technique gets passed on? Or is there multiple instances where you can have the same curse technique? Is this because of something else? Like, what is, go what is this guy's connection to Nanami? W what is going on here? Because this isn't just a nod to Nanami. This dude is clearly going to be part, it even says, culling game player. He's now in the culling game. And he's talking with the Nanami curse technique, with the 7 to 3. With the ratio technique. So I'm just, like, one of the big things is going to be the whole Yuta uh, or, or uh, Kinji being stronger than Yuta thing. But this is going to be the other main thing. I think I'm going to try to make this my thumbnail. This is going to be the other main thing. Because this is, wow. This is, this is nuts. Like, I have no idea where they're going to take this direction. I'm sure there's tons of theories out there. I'm going to be checking out a bunch of different videos to see what other people are saying about the 7 to 3 thing because maybe I missed something. I've only read through the series once uh, and I only just got caught up by chapter 143. So everything's still like there was a lot of info. I might have been forgetting something. But uh, 
yeah, this this is a way to end a chapter. This was a great chapter for people like me who needed a little more uh, in depth on the culling game rules, but also it's a good way to sort of get us pumped up for some other things. We got the angel. We got uh, the fact that the we're gonna have a bunch of uh, Maki stuff going on. They're gonna go grab the suspended third year. We've got Nanami's technique back and somebody else. How the hell is that a thing? I don't know, but this this chapter was incredibly good. I really enjoyed the chapter. I didn't find it weak. Some people probably found it slow if you already understood the culling game rules and you're just like, okay, come on, but can we get back to the action? Um, so some people might have felt that way. I didn't. I needed this type of chapter. What did you guys think? Like, comment, and subscribe as always. It's always very much appreciated. And don't forget to hit that bell notification button and all that fun jazz. Don't forget to drink responsibly as for a change I am. And we'll see you back here next time, guys, for chapter 147. Have a good one. See ya.